The film you've just seen concentrates on the processes by which rock shatters, the mechanical breakdown of rock, the physical weathering processes, as they're called. The kinds of processes that lead rocks like this granite in the Arctic, on Devon Island in fact, in the mid-Arctic, to shatter and break and to fall into streams in angular fragments. This granite in California, however, has evidently decayed in a very different fashion. The outcrop is rounded rather than jagged, and the sand at the foot of the little clearly contrasts very markedly with the fresh basalt here, this angular, jagged piece of fresh basalt that we broke with a, with a hammer. Uh, clearly, too, this granite is not at all the rock that it used to be, and not at all like this fresh granite. Clearly, this granite and the basalt have begun to break grain from grain. The coarse interlocking texture of igneous rocks that we looked at when we looked at the formation of igneous rocks, the cooling and crystallization of igneous rocks, has been lost. The rocks are beginning to disintegrate grain from grain. Evidently something is attacking the minerals. If we look further at what's going on, and examine specimens like this, we find that on this fresh surface, which has no relief, just rather jagged as it broke with a hammer, the dark crystals, which are garnets, and the pink material, which is mostly feldspar, don't, st don't have any kind of relief at all. It's just a fresh break. But on this specimen, we can see that the garnets are beginning to stand out, stand out like beans almost on the, on the surface of the, of the specimen. This is a specimen which has been exposed at the surface, and evidently the material between the garnets has been worn away in some fashion, while the garnets have remained standing out from the specimen. We call this differential weathering, and we find the same kind of thing in this specimen here, in which there's a, a vein of rather pinkish material, which in fact is dominantly quartz with a little bit of feldspar mixed in. And that vein stands out quite clearly by a, with a relief of about an inch from the rather dark material which surrounds it. That dark material, in contrast to the small vein, is formed mostly of minerals which are rich in iron and magnesium, the ferromagnesium minerals, things like pyroxenes and hornblendes. The specimen behind it also shows this phenomenon of differential weathering, but it's a sedimentary rock and the reason is rather different. We'll come back to it, come back to it later. Now, why should that kind of differential weathering occur? Why do some parts of igneous and metamorphic rocks, some minerals of igneous and metamorphic rocks, stand out and remain uh, on the surface as obvious uh, features like the garnet while the material around, the mineral around, uh, decays and breaks. Why do some granites just break like uh, some very breakable piece of plaster, for example? Well, the answer to that lies in the minerals themselves. Remember that the minerals of igneous rocks, like olivine and pyroxene and amphibole, biotite, and so forth, are formed at a high temperature. The highest being those rich in iron and magnesium, and the lowest being quartz. And the temperature range being from perhaps 1,500 degrees down to six or 700 degrees. Clearly, conditions deep within the earth. And yet, on the surface of the earth, 
those minerals are subjected to an atmosphere rich in carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water, a totally foreign environment to the high pressure, high temperature environment in which the minerals formed. Now, as you might expect, the reason why some minerals persist, whereas others uh, decay around them, so to speak, is that those which were formed at the highest temperatures are most unstable when they're exposed on the surface of the earth to carbon dioxide, water, and oxygen. And those which are formed at the lowest temperatures during the crystallization of an igneous or a metamorphic rock are less unstable when they're exposed on the surface of the earth. So the garnet, for example, one might conclude, was formed at a lower temperature than the feldspar which surrounded it. And the feldspar has decayed while the garnet has been able to persist. In this specimen of basalt, the first mineral to decay is olivine. And the next would be pyroxene. And the way that the olivine decays is hinted at by the color of the basalt. It's rather rusty, as you can see, a sort of a rusty brown. And that is the hint that tells us how the pyroxene and the olivine have probably broken down. In fact, that brownish color is iron oxide. It's the mineral limonite. And the process by which the limonite was formed is by oxidation. And sometimes, instead of limonite, we get another iron oxide that you already know, hematite. These, then, are minerals produced by the oxidation of the iron which is present in the olivine, pyroxene, and also in amphibole and biotite. The iron in the original minerals is bound up in the crystals of the silicates, but when exposed at the surface, that iron combines with oxygen to produce limonite and hematite, iron oxides. The process by which the limonite and the hematite are produced from the iron in those silicate minerals is rather akin to the rusting of a nail. If we take an ordinary nail, an ordinary iron nail, and immerse it in water which is in contact with the air and therefore there is oxygen dissolved in the water, we can watch what happens with time-lapse photography over a period of about 12 hours. Clearly the nail is beginning to rust. The iron in the nail is being attacked, or gobbled up if you like, by the oxygen that's dissolved in the water. And the mineral limonite is being formed. We call it rust. And eventually the nail, if it rusts sufficiently, will break.